Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. There are all kinds of markets to invest in, but what can you do to ensure great, stable cash flow? That's what we're going to talk about today, choosing the right markets and understanding the different types of real estate markets. Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. All aboard. Registration is now open for the Real Estate Guys 16th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, the authors of Prosper, Chris Martinson and Adam Taggart, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. And joining us live and in person for his sixth Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. And lots more to be announced. It all begins April 6, 2018 in Fort Lauderdale. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to learn more and reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys and an all-star faculty on the 16th Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Don't miss the boat. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, co-host, financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, it is a big old world, and there are so many places to invest. And people often ask us when they meet us in person, hey, you know, what markets do you guys like? And that's a perfectly valid question. I like to ask real estate investors, hey, what markets are you in? What markets are you looking at? But there are such a variety of markets. And I thought what we do today is talk about how you build a portfolio of real estate that is diverse in its strategy, meaning you're in different markets, maybe different product types. We're going to focus on markets today, just like you'd build a stock portfolio. And I, I thought, you know, folks don't often approach it this way. But if we talk through some of the characteristics of the different types of markets, you'll be able to listen along and develop kind of a, hey, that makes sense to me or that doesn't and figure out what kind of markets do you want to be in? Yeah. I mean, before you even go there, I mean, it's the, just the idea that you ask people, hey, what markets are you in? Sometimes you get people that look at you like deer in the headlights. What do you mean? I live in such and such a place. Oh, well, yeah, but where do you invest? What are you talking about? I mean, you know, they don't even understand the concept of, of investing outside where they happen to live. And so I think the first paradigm breaker is your famous quote, Robert, which is live where you want to live, but invest where the numbers make sense. And so once you've opened your mind up to that, then the idea is, okay, what am I looking for in a market? How do I know? And, and it's partly what's going on inside the market and economic indicators and some things we'll talk about today. Uh, but it's also uh, has to do a little bit with lifestyle and preferences. Uh, so there is a lot of different markets, a lot of different personalities, if you will. Markets are a lot like people. They have personalities, they have traits, they have characteristics, they have habits, uh, they have culture. And so some of those you're going to get along with as an investor, some not so much. And so really, even before you start shopping for a market, one of the things we always talk about is the importance of understanding who you are as an investor and what it is you're looking for your portfolio to do, not just in terms of financial result, but in terms of your interaction with it from a lifestyle perspective. Yeah, it's a good point that the markets are going to shift and change over time. So only today can you make a decision about a market based on the facts of today, and it may change. And one of the unique things about real estate is we get, as we often say, married to a market. If I'm going to buy a piece of real estate for a long-term buy and hold, I'm going to be involved in that market for three years, five years, 10 years, 25 years. I personally like to approach every piece of real estate I'm interested in from the perspective that Will I be comfortable with this in my portfolio for the rest of my days, right? As opposed to, oh, I'm going to buy and I'm going to get out. I'm going to buy the peak and, and sell on the dip and all that kind of stuff. It's no, I'm a collector of real estate. I'm going to put more and more in my portfolio. So we won't discuss it today because we don't have time. But your homework would be if you haven't figured out your personal investment philosophy, what makes you tick as an investor, you can search the archives and find shows where we've talked about that and walk you through that exercise of understanding who you are as an investor, because that will dictate, as Russ points out, some of the markets you'll be interested in. And rather than talk about specific markets, I mean, we may use some examples, but the concept is not all real estate markets behave the same way. It may be that you live in a market that has great real estate opportunity. And to your point, Russ, a lot of people just invest where they live. But, you know, a lot of people live in places where they aren't necessarily the greatest deals or the greatest investments. And that's why I say live wherever you want to live. 
but invest where the numbers work, where they make sense. And that, of course, presupposes that you know what numbers you're looking for. But we're going to assume for today's show that you're clear on what you want to accomplish with real estate. Again, if you're not, you go back and search the archives for personal investment philosophy and get clear. But markets behave differently. And so I thought what we'd do is go through what some of the types of markets are and just kind of the way that we view markets and what the market can do for you if you find the right market. And there's a bunch of different ways to look at it, but there's two kind of categories of real estate markets. Just like when we teach personal investment philosophy, we talk about our primary continuum, which is, are you a cash flow investor where you're investing based on monthly return and you really don't care what happens to the value of the property, you're all about buying it for the cash flow? Or on the other end of a continuum, and it's not an either or, it's not a coin, it's a continuum. On the other end is, am I a growth of equity investor? I want to buy property strategically in markets that are positioned to go up over time and that's where I'm going to make my money. We make money in lots of different ways in real estate, but the two, cash flow and equity growth, kind of are the things that separate the markets. The other have more to do with taxes and finances. So I think if we look at those those two types of markets, within that, there's a lot of different market types you can consider. So the first we'll start with is the proven, stable, some might call it boring, rental markets. These are places where over time it's been shown that investors who buy single family houses or fourplexes or apartment buildings can do well. There's good what we call durability of the rents. So this is a market that isn't fancy, it doesn't sizzle, it's not sexy, but it just sits there and creates a return. The tenants that are in now pay a market rent and they're happy to do so. If they move out, there's plenty of tenants uh, who would take their place, uh, a, a stable real estate market. So before we get too deep into that, one thing to take into consideration is just the basic fundamental concept in all investing and economics, which is supply and demand. And so when you're looking at a, a given market and you're trying to understand, is it going to cash flow? Is it going to have equity growth? Uh, which direction is it headed? It's always going to be a function or a byproduct of supply and demand. So in a cash flow market, obviously what you need to have is a steady demand for rental property, which means you're going to have to have the kind of economy that is going to create working class jobs. You're going to have to have a culture in a marketplace that is going to lend itself more towards working class folks, tenant class, if you will. And then you're going to need to make sure that you have a supply situation of rental properties that's going to favor decent occupancies. And so that's all. those are all going to be important factors. So Memphis, Tennessee, for example. Memphis has got a reputation for being the bankruptcy capital of the world. And you think, oh my God, that would be a terrible place to invest. Well, yes and no. The idea that for whatever reason, uh, generally speaking, and of course, everything is in generalizations, uh, the folks in Memphis, for whatever reason, tend not to be as good at managing money, which means they don't save money, which means they don't have down payments, which means that they rent because they, uh, even though the rents easily could qualify them for a mortgage to buy, they can't quite come up with the down payment. It's also a, a working town. So a lot of the people there are doing working class distribution. FedEx is a big player there. And so you have people who are the types of folks that are lifelong renters. And so from that standpoint, it's been a wonderful cash flow market uh, with a good demand of tenants uh, that are coming in and, and providing good stable rent. So that's just an example of, of kind of some of the things we look at when we're looking at a marketplace in terms of, is it going to cash flow? Is it going to cash flow predictably over the long haul? And so of course, when we say Memphis, that's a big place. It's one of the markets that you would definitely consider proven and stable, but there's not a big expectancy on the part of investors that prices are going to go up over the time we've been you know in memphis and pointing at memphis and meeting people there we've seen house prices go up a little but it's a cash flow market and that may be that you need some of that in your portfolio yeah i want to make sure that my first couple of properties are providing monthly cash flow and so you're looking for the not only what it looks like today but your best guess as to where it's headed. You know, when we do the Memphis field trip, we often are able to get somebody from the Memphis Chamber of Commerce to come speak, which is great because a, a Chamber of Commerce doesn't really have much to do with real estate. Their mission is to be the PR arm for the town to bring in new business, co 
companies relocating and industries. And so they often know what's coming next and why they can't always give us the names of companies that are considering Memphis. They often will say, hey, we're talking to, you know, this 200 person employer, this thousand person employer. I remember the last time we went, there was a huge new warehouse by a big distribution company whose name starts with an A and it has a Z in it. Anyway, there's a lot there that you see as you go around and that all has to do with the future demand. So supply and demand are hard to get your mind around. There's not really easy ways to go figure that stuff out, but there are ways to figure it out. And that's part of having a team and so forth. So the first kind of market is just a proven, stable, boring rental market. Now, on the other side of that coin is a proven, stable equity growth market. This is a market where the cash flow numbers rarely make sense. I mean, you, unless you put 50 or 60% down, you're not even going to break even. But over time, persistent demand has escalated prices. Take the San Francisco Bay Area, San Jose, San Francisco, some of those areas that for years and years, there's been persistent demand because of commerce and industry and the beautiful weather and so forth. But it's hard to make the cash flow numbers work. I mean, Russ, you and I both started in California, in fact, Northern California, in fact, the Bay Area. And it was a great market back in the day. And today, as far as escalation of value, it's an amazing market. Yeah, it's crazy. But obviously, that marketplace uh, underwent a transformation. You and I lived through it. We grew up there. It went from being a sleepy little orchard town to being uh, the technology hub of the world. And when that happened, all kinds of venture capital money came in, all kinds of global profits came in. And yet you had the ocean, you had the mountains, you had the green belt, and you had the bay. And so it really restricted the ability of the marketplace to add new housing supply. At some point, the demand for housing and the capacity to pay a high price for that housing and the inability of the marketplace to expand the supply made the prices only go one direction and that was up. And so a big part of the uh, growth of Silicon Valley and the San Francisco Bay Area has been the tech industry's ability to continue to reinvent itself, to continue to innovate, to continue to attract capital, uh, and to be able to afford to pay out high salaries. And then you marry that to what's going on in the stock market because so many of those people uh, have stock options and their company stock that they earn as part of their compensation uh, ends up contributing a lot to their ability to bid up properties. And one of the ugly things that happens in an environment that is you you get a big gap between the haves and the have not. Some of these places have the worst homeless problems. They have the biggest income inequality because there is no affordable housing. Either you can afford to live in a home, a million dollar, million and a half dollar kind of rank and file, three bedroom, two bath home on a postage stamp size lot, or you can't and you're living in tent city or you're commuting, you know, 60 miles from uh, someplace far away to come into where the work is. So these are some of the challenges that, you know, as a landlord, you look at that and like, well, how do I, how do I make, get a property here that's going to make sense? Anybody that can afford to pay the rent for what I'm going to need to pay for the property uh, probably is going to be able to afford to buy. And so it's great if you want to speculate on the real estate and, you know, you buy a million dollar property and say, hey, 10 years from now, it's probably going to be worth $2 million. I can make a million bucks, uh, but you might have to feed it along the way. And that's a that's a different style of investing, obviously, than cash flow investing. Well, it absolutely is. And it's not a right or wrong. It's absolutely a valid way to invest, to buy something that you have to feed a little bit and then it becomes worth more. And if you buy strategically and you sharpen your pencil and you really get out there, you can probably collapse those time frames. You can buy in an area that is really, you know, racing up and make a quick profit. And we certainly had our uh, hand in that in some California markets, and that can be fun and exciting, but it also can go against you if the market pulls out from underneath you. So there's pros and cons, but those are really kind of on, on two extremes. There's the proven cash flow stable market. It spits off a six to eight to 10% return and the value of the property might hardly ever go up. And then there's a market where every year it seems like the house is worth more. We used to joke in the Bay Area, hey, last year your house probably earned more than you did. There were houses, you know, median homes in the Bay Area that were going up by a hundred grand a year and a few people around didn't make that kind of money then. So that's an interesting paradigm. Now, what about in the middle? Is there a market that offers cash flow and growth? 
Well, of course, but before you just say, oh, I'll take that, the easy way out is to go, well, I want something that has both. Well, of course you do, but there's trade-offs and the trade-offs don't always work to your advantage. What's a market that has decent cash flow and is proven, but has also gone up over time? Well, that might be a market like Orlando, Florida. There's good cash flow on those houses, but prices have gone up and there is continued demand and there's diversity of industry and there's more jobs. It might be a market like Phoenix, Arizona, where we used to have really good cash flows, but because prices have been persistently going up, they're not quite as good or even Dallas, Texas. So again, not to say, hey, these are markets you should pick, but understanding a market that has both equity and cash flow. Well, I think it's important to study markets and look at their history so you can see the transition. Uh, I joke all the time about a very old Neil Diamond song called I Am I Said. And if you go look that up, it was written in the early 70s. And the opening line is he's contrasting New York City to LA. And his comment about LA is that rents are low. Well, rents aren't low in L.A. anymore, but L.A. made a transition. It went from being a big, sprawling you know, area where there was a lot of open land and housing being built everywhere to where it finally had attracted so many people and so much industry, it became crowded. When we first started going to Dallas, Texas 10 years ago, my very first reaction was, wow, I I've seen this movie because I lived in Southern California in the late 70s, and I saw the transition as cities blended together, as all of the places that could be developed had been developed. And as the sprawl began, people who were already there began saying, hey, we, we've got to curtail some of this construction or we're just going to be nothing but concrete. And you start seeing people doing things to preserve open spaces. When you start seeing that happen and a lot of freeway infrastructure going in, which means a lot of people can move around and it's a business friendly environment. And there are, uh, you begin to get critical mass or what I call gravitational pull Great educational infrastructure, great travel infrastructure, a friendly business environment, great labor pool, businesses starting to move in there. That's what happened in Silicon Valley. That's what happened in Southern California. It's what's been happening in Dallas. And so you talked earlier at the top of the show, Robert, about the concept of continuums. And marketplaces do continuums. You can have a marketplace that's been a very solid cash flow market because it had, like Dallas, where it had the capacity to continue to expand supply uh, almost at an unlimited basis. But at some point, it begins to transition. And now you've got people still coming in like gangbusters and you have a robust local economy driving up wages and, and people's ability and capacity to pay. And yet you have begun to slow down the ability of the marketplace to continue to add additional inventory. And so the market begins to shift. And so if you catch it uh, kind of in the middle, you can have a market that still cash flows pretty well well, it's on the path to becoming an equity market. When you study different markets and their histories and you watch for the things that happened when they went through those transitions, then you can begin to look at a market that you're considering and say, where is it on the continuum? Which direction is it headed in? What's the trend? And where do I think this thing is going to be five years or 10 years from now if I extrapolate out that trend and it continues on as it's been? And ultimately, you ask yourself from the other markets you've studied in their history, where have I seen this movie before? For me, it was easy to see where Dallas was headed based on what I saw happen in Southern California. It just it, I, it felt exactly the same to me. And of course, now over 10 years, that's what we've seen happening. And there's two parts of that. There's the evolution of a market, and then there's the cyclical nature of a market. So we look at where is a market in the cycle, and then we look at where is the market in its lifetime. And there's really four parts of it. A market has growth stage, where it's new, and it's just being explored, and it grows. Then it has kind of an equal equilibrium where most of the area is developed and prices are holding stable, maybe going up a little bit. And then eventually there's a decline and the market is falls out of favor or people are moving to the suburbs or whatever the case is. And then often there's revitalization and it, it heads back up, if you will. And you can catch a market at various times like that. And the bigger point is that if you can study the market and understand there is an evolution a market that was once a cash flow market like Dallas, Texas, can absolutely evolve into being now a very mixed market. Now, the challenge is today, if I were to look at Dallas, I go, well, it's, you know, it's, it's expensive. It's hard to find a good deal that pencils out. Exactly. So how do you get in before? That's what we're going to talk about next today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com.
Memphis is famous for being the home of the king of rock and roll, but it's also the king of cash flow. If you're looking for affordable cash flow properties, it's hard to beat Memphis. Get your portfolio rocking and more cash flowing your way by calling Terry Kerr at Mid-South Home Buyers. Terry's the king of turnkey properties. Contact Terry through the resource section at realestateguysradio.com. And be sure to order Terry's tips for turnkey rental property investing report. It's free. Just send your request to turnkey at realestateguysradio.com. If you want to retire in the next five years or less through real estate, then please pay close attention. My name is Brad Sumrock, and I've taught thousands of my students how to replace their incomes, quit their jobs, and retire faster than they ever thought possible by not investing in single-family homes. You see, there's a secret to retiring fast with little risk, and it has nothing to do with being a landlord, fixing toilets, or flipping houses. The secret is multifamily apartment buildings. Starting from scratch with zero experience, I managed to pocket over $1 million in cash and retire from my 17-year corporate job within three years of apartment investing. Now, this is not your typical no-money-down real estate training. We believe in smart, hard work for intelligent people. So if you're good with your finances, have a decent job, or saving your money, and you're looking for a change in getting out of the rat race, then investing in apartment buildings might just be the answer you've been looking for. Send an email right now to sumrock at realestateguysradio.com to get the details of my upcoming training event and you also receive my free training webinar, Apartment Investing for Beginners. That's sumrock, S-U-M-R-O-K, at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Kevin Harrington, an original shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show today. Hey, if you've ever wanted to do bigger deals using other people's money, well, then you need to get on out to The Secrets of Successful Syndication. We'll be in Dallas, Texas, speaking of Dallas, uh, the first weekend in March. It's an amazing event. More than 100 people registered already. You need to be there. You can take your business and your investing to the next level. Plus, we've got an amazing faculty. All the details at realestateguysradio.com under events. Look for the secrets of successful syndication. We're talking today about building a stable real estate portfolio based on diversifying your market. You know, one of the basic premises or tenets of investing is that diversity can help you avoid the highs and lows often associated with investing. At the same time, we're often quoted as saying diversity is a recipe for mediocrity. Meaning if I'm too diverse, I buy a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that, then pretty soon, whatever great gains I might get from one market are completely offset by other markets. So, the, but, the, but the idea is the same as, say, you know, Russ, you were licensed in securities for a while. You know, stock investors often approach their portfolios this way. Yeah, it's called asset allocation. And so you have a portion of your uh, portfolio that's dedicated towards emergency, liquidity, high stability, you know, cash and cash equivalent things that you can liquidate quickly that have fairly stable values, uh, at least as measured in dollars, then you're going to have uh, a portion that is designed to hedge against downtimes, and that's debt, bonds. Part of it produces income. Uh, and then you're going to have your long-term capital growth, which are going to be your, your growth stocks. Uh, blue chip stocks would be something you'd consider to be kind of middle, where you've got maybe long-term conservative growth because it's a big company. They're not going to have explosive growth growth, but they're going to produce a steady dividend. They're going to be fairly stable. You know, they're going to be there. So, you know, when you're looking at building your portfolio, you want to make sure that you're leveraging uh, what's going on in the marketplace. And so you may rebalance or reallocate and, and overweight, they call it, certain things, uh, right? If you feel like you're in the middle of a uh, an equities rally like we've been in in the stock market for quite some time now, you're going to overweight in that direction because the yields on bonds have been very low, but the the growth on stocks has been very high. Uh, at the same time, if all of a sudden there was reason to believe that the equity rally had ended and things were going to start to get tight, then you're going to pull out of stocks. You're going to move into something more like bonds where your principal is is more guaranteed. So you can do the same thing with real estate. So you you know you may look at your 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 overall portfolio and say, and just in terms of your real estate investing and say, okay, I want to be 50% of my investable money in good, solid cash flow markets, you know, I'm going to get maybe a low double digit 
type of return, you know, total return, uh, but it's going to be predictable. It's going to be steady, no shock waves. Uh, and yet I'm going to take maybe 30% and I'm going to dedicate that towards aggressive growth markets. I'm going to go into markets where I think I'm in the path of progress. I'm going to look for supply demand imbalances forming, put myself there and, and hope to ride a good wave and, and catch some good equity growth. Uh, and then, you know, the balance of your portfolio, either 10 or 20% may be involved in uh, just being liquid, you know, what I'd call an opportunity fund so that you have the opportunity if a, a scream and deal comes along, a distress situation or there's some big downturn in the market, uh, you've got a little cash. Remember, we interviewed Donald Trump. We asked him, you know, what did you learn in the uptimes? Not much. What did you learn in the downtimes? Always have a little cash on hand. Uh, looking back to 2008, I, I wish that that would have been advice that I would have been aware of. It would have been good to have some dry powder because when real estate prices fell, you know, the bubble didn't pop. Everybody says, oh, the bubble popped. It didn't pop. Real estate didn't disappear. It wasn't destroyed. You know, when a balloon pops, it's gone forever. But that's not what happened. What happened is it just let out some air and the prices dropped. Well, you know, anytime prices drop, that's a great time to be buying. But you have to be in a position to do that. So it's always good to have a little bit of cash on hand to take advantage of those market cycles uh, and grab bargains when they're when they're to be had. Yeah. So how do you approach what you would call an aggressive growth market in real estate? Well, there is no sure way because we don't know exactly where the market is going to go. We call those markets emerging markets, either an emerging rental market or an emerging equity market, meaning they're not proven, it's not stable, but you see there's good possibility. And there are markets like that right now that, hey, let's watch this market. Let's see where it's going. Let's see what's happening. So it doesn't mean that the market is brand new. It's like a new town popped up somewhere. It's just the stage of what's happening in the market. Big company or big industry moves in. All of a sudden, there's more employees. There's more need for housing. Rents go up. Then landlords rush in and say, well, we need to build some more apartments, build some more houses. And they overbuild because they're not coordinated. Everyone's not talking to everybody. Then there's too much supply, right? So there's opportunity, but in an emerging market, you have the opportunity to ride the gain as well as the increase in rents, but you also have the risk of it maybe not happening. So allocating a portion of your portfolio into those markets makes sense. A lot of the markets that we've been in over the years were at the first part of our investing career, emerging markets, and then became fairly stable markets. So this might be like, oh, I don't know, a Pittsburgh or Cleveland or St. Louis or a market where there's been rental for some time, but there's a reason it's starting to take off. You know, Atlanta, people have been looking at Atlanta for a long time, and it's so big, you can't say, well, Atlanta is a market. There's so many sub-markets, almost too many sub-markets, but a lot of speculation, of course, about the, the new Amazon second headquarters and what that's going to do to real estate pricing and so forth. And those are the kinds of things you're watch, watching for in those markets. So it's not that you just say, well, I, I want to have, you know, just a gro this much in, my, in a growth market. I, I think you want to be leery of overexposure to any one market and any one type of market. I might be in three different markets, but they're they're all proven stable, boring rental markets, then there's just not a ton of upside. Again, if your personal investment philosophy is all about that, that's fine. But the concept of put all your eggs in one basket and watch the basket means you own a lot of property in the same market. There are some advantages to that, right? You get a great team, you get some efficiencies and some economies of scale and so on. But the downside is if that market has a hiccup or a problem or enters that stage of heading downward, that decline, then your whole portfolio is in that decline. So I think it does make some sense to have some diversity. And so there's some other types of markets that uh, we want to talk about. So we've talked about, you know, stable markets and equity growth markets and then emerging markets in both categories. Now let's talk about some other specific potential types of markets. A college market. What's a college market? Well, there's a lot of great income housing near colleges and universities, and it's captive, meaning there's a number of students that come in every year and a number of students that graduate every year, and they continue to have a need for housing. We've done very well personally in this marketplace by owning property close to colleges and universities. You've got a built-in client base. So there's pros and cons like there is to any market, but generally when you have a student, and especially if mom and dad are helping, 
that's pretty good durability of income. Yeah, well, let's just talk about that for just a sec, because it's such an interesting space. And with everything going on, and we've done shows in the past on about disruption, uh, you always have to ask yourself, well, how, how could this way we look at the world, this paradigm, shift? So for example, online learning. Is it really going to be necessary for uh, students to go to a physical location to go to college? Well, from a technological point of view, you could make the argument, oh, it's not necessary. But then you have to look at human nature. And at some point, you know, kids get to be 18, 19 years old. I think they're ready not to be with mom and dad anymore. And mom and dad are ready for them not to be with mom and dad anymore. And so going to live on your own, kind of semi on your own while you're going to college is a rite of passage for a lot of young people. Now, technologically, you might be able to replicate their learning, but you can't replicate the lifestyle of getting out of the house and living kind of semi on your own and having that, that transition into full-blown adult life. Uh, so I think that when you're looking at something like student housing, you have to ask yourself, what is going on technologically? What is going on uh, socially uh, that might affect that product type? And then, of course, you know, you have to look at, again, the basic supply and demand, even within that particular niche, what's going on in the particular college town uh, that you're looking at. You know, how robust is the institution itself? How great is their marketing? How great is their appeal? And then how much supply of student housing is there? There. And then, you you know, you have to look at that. And then, and then of course, it drills down to specific neighborhoods and specific deals and, and all of that. But I think the, the bigger standpoint is there's so many things that you just can't assume that tomorrow is going to be like it was yesterday. And you have to ask yourself uh, all of the factors that are affecting why somebody is going to uh, move into a certain type of property and create that demand. And you got to look at technology and you got to look at society. And those are going to be two major inputs uh, in addition to just the regular uh, supply and demand factors. Now, there are some great resources when it comes to this area. In fact, one of your best resources are the colleges and universities in those systems themselves because they have great data on incoming applications and their expected sizes of classes and their student population and all that. So I'm not saying that the, any college is a good place to look for a house next to it to rent out, but there are certainly some. Now, a lot of universities have a lot of on-campus student housing, whether it's, you know, dorms, or the Greek system or just big uh, developers that have brought it, you know, that housing close by. So sometimes they're overbuilt. But if you're careful, this can be a stable, stable market. We're talking today about different types of real estate markets. How do you stabilize your real estate income by diversifying across market types? We've got lots more to talk about and we're going to play real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. This portion of the Real Estate Guys radio program is brought to you by International Coffee Farms, where you can own a parcel of land in your very own specialty coffee farm in Panama for as little as $15,000. Here's how it works. Deeded half-acre parcels entitled Specialty Coffee Farms in Boquete, Panama are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts. Sustainable average income is estimated at 12% and cash flow can begin within 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm is committed to a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the Panamanian coffee farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates nine specialty coffee farms with half-acre parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a coffee farm owner in Paquete, Panama, email coffee at realestateguysradio.com. That's coffee at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects 
totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show today. We're talking about different types of real estate markets. And before we get back to that discussion, we are super excited to have a guest with us. Please welcome the amazing Tim Harridge. How are you, Tim? <laughs> I'm doing great, Robert. How are you? Really good. And uh, a lot of our listeners may not understand your background, but you're kind of well known as one of these awesome single family guys. Tell us about uh, how you got into real estate investing and uh, how you figured out the game. You know, I'm an odd duck. I got out of the Marine Corps back in 2001, shortly before 9-11. And I watched a late night TV infomercial and real estate just seemed super interesting. And it really was appealing to me for the no money, no credit side, because I had really neither <laughs> after just getting <laughs> off active duty in the Marine Corps and being in combat zones and things like that. But, you know, I bought the course. The course thing didn't work out for me, but I went to a local real estate club, you know, met some great people there that were willing to share their knowledge and expertise. And I took a job as a project manager for one of the local investors that then turned into me taking a job in an acquisitions role for a local investor that then turned into me buying a home investors franchise with my wife. And they, they kind of say the rest is history, but uh, this business is just something that's always appealed to me. I think mostly for me, it's the art of the deal. I love structuring deals and networking and that type of stuff. So if there's ever a crowd about real estate investing, just uh, look around. I'm probably in it. <laughs> All right. Well, to that end, coming up, you've got your single family rental expo, which we're excited to be uh, coming to in Dallas, Texas. It's the 17th and 18th of February, uh, right around the corner. Tell us about the expo. Well, so back in my older days when I owned a franchise in this business, we had an annual convention. And the annual convention was just this great place to go to get motivated, to pick up little ideas, tips and tricks, things that people were doing right, things people were doing wrong. And it was just a couple days of high-intensity networking and uh, education. So I've run these type of events before. I was the founder of a large event that was sold off a couple years ago. And I thought the time was right to put together another high-quality event um, that is focused on those that desire to create wealth through owning real estate, specifically single family. But, you know, for me, even the multifamily guys that I know in the space, the vast majority of them started out in the single family sector. I know there's a lot of my friends that own hundreds of single families that also own, you know, uh, hundreds of doors of multifamily. So, it is called the Single Family Rental Expo, but it's more about the ideology behind owning assets that produce income to create and maintain wealth, I think is really the, the overarching premise behind the show. And so the way it works is Saturday and Sunday, the 17th and 18th of February, there'll be you know, eight, 900 investors at the Irving Convention Center. And at that event, there are 12 breakouts on Saturday. There's nine on Sunday. There's a dozen panel topics between the two days. There's a couple keynotes, but the keynote presentations, right, they're not someone that's up there trying to sell a book or a tape. You'll find none of that at the, at the SFR Expo or any event that I host. One of the keynotes on Saturday the 17th is Beth O'Brien, the CEO of Corvass Finance, who you know used to be Colony American Finance, that just is pioneering a pilot program from Freddie Mac that is originating 30-year fixed mortgages using Freddie Mac's backing to real estate investors based off the cash flow of the property, not their personal debt-to-income ratio. Game-changer type stuff that we all want to learn about and hear about and hear where the pilot program is going. And so that's 
just one example of the type of thing that's going to be discussed at the expo. Yeah, a bunch of great folks there who are teaching and sharing. And one of the things we appreciate about you, Tim, is that you don't have that run to the back of the room today, today only, right? The big upsell. It's a lot of great information. Certainly some of these folks have education and programs that you may be interested in. But uh, just looking over your speaker packet, it's got to be great content, deliver the message, and not a lot of sales, which we appreciate. People love to buy they just hate to be sold. So excited about that part of it. And uh, if you want tickets, hang on in just a minute. We'll show you how you can get into this event. You know, I, I see this as a great event for folks that have maybe been on this path for a while because you're going to be covering things like, you know, notes and, and uh, multifamily and, of course, lots of different niches. But uh, also, I think, for maybe the person thinking about getting investing or new to real estate investing. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget my first Aereo meeting, which was the real estate club that I went to here in Dallas the first time. And, you know, I had that feeling of, my gosh, I don't belong. I don't know anything. All these people are going to know more than me. And I, I just remember how, how, how welcoming it was and how much I was able to learn, even though I was a novice. And I, and, and I think, you know, the beautiful thing about the way we set up the expo is about every hour and a half, there are three different breakouts and a panel. So if you're relatively new, for instance, during the 10 o'clock hour on Saturday, you may have an option to go listen to structuring owner finance notes. You may have an option to go listen to legal indicate implications of, you know, setting up your entity for success in real estate. You may have an opportunity to go listen to someone talk about marketing your business and generating leads. But then you also may have a chance to go to a panel at that time that is, uh, we're going to have a couple panels that are uh, one panel, for instance, is going to be people that have gone from zero to 10 rent houses and putting them up, up on the stage and letting them talk to the audience about how they did it and what they wish they'd done different, what they wish they'd done more of and what their plans are to go to the next level. And then later in the day, you'll have a panel of what I'm calling, you know, the 15 to 50, right? How do how, these people that go from, you know, 15 houses at a time or 15 houses a year to 50 houses at a time or 50 houses a year, like what are they doing and how, and what's their business look like? And then we're even going to have the hundred to 500 panel just so that we can all sit in awe of the people that own, you know, literally hundreds of, of real estate properties across the, the nation. So I, I think, there's something for everyone. Uh, there's obviously the one, the hundred to five hundred is a place where someone like myself, with my experience, may uh, sit and take notes because it's applicable. Uh, but even if it wasn't applicable, I would sit there and dream. I would sit there and, and, and soak it in and understand what it takes to get to that level one day. And you know, at the end of the day, I may choose not to sit in that panel. And that's the beautiful thing about the expo because if I don't want that panel there would be three other educational sessions going on at that time. All right, good stuff. Well, it's coming up, so make your decision quickly. Very inexpensive. It includes lunch, coffee for the day, and you'll meet a whole bunch of folks. If you'd like to get tickets, all you have to do is go to our website at realestateguysradio.com. Under events, you'll see the Single Family Rental Expo, or you can send an email to sfrexpo, that's Single Family Rental, Expo, SFR Expo at realestateguysradio.com. Tim, we appreciate you putting this uh, event on, taking some time to share with us today, and we will see you there. Hey, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Awesome. Really looking forward to it. Thanks, Tim. Hey, speaking of things to look forward to, every week on the Real Estate Guys, we play Real Estate Trivia, your chance to win a prize by knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question. Just a minute, I'm going to give you a trivia question that has something to do with real estate. In fact, markets in a way. As soon as you hear the question, think you know the answer, send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your mailing address, the answer to the question, and the first person is going to get a copy of an amazing book by Brian Tracy called Eat That Frog. Lots of great tools for time management, productivity, and overcoming procrastination. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week on the show, we talked about making the jump from single units to multi-unit investing with Steve Olson. And we asked this, in what city was the United Nations Charter drafted and ratified back in 1945? Well, the answer, San Francisco, California. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. In which U.S. state will you find the town of Bitter End? Yep, Bitter End. It's in the U.S. Which state is it in? If you think you know, or just want to take a guess, 
or maybe you've been there, send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. That's trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address so we can send you a physical copy of Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy if you're the winner. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about stabilizing your real estate portfolio through diversifying in different marketplaces and specifically going through different kinds of marketplaces. So the last one we discussed was a college market, which is a unique kind of market. There's also, you know, blue collar working towns and so forth. But another type of market that is different than others is a retirement market. Now, the big difference is that when we look at what drives a market, Many real estate investors think it's all about jobs, but in reality, there are markets where it's not all about jobs and retirement markets are one of those types of markets where, yeah, people are employed there, but it's not too much primary employment. It's secondary and tertiary employment, meaning the jobs are to support the people that live there. So what are markets like that? Think of markets like Boca Raton, Florida. Or Palm Springs, you certainly have people that are working there and there may be good opportunity to provide housing for them, but there's also a lot of retirees. And one of the things about retirees today is they're more active and they're less likely to buy a house than they've been in the past, meaning they recognize many of them went through the turmoil. Maybe they lost a house. Maybe they had difficulty and they're like, you know what? I could rent and be just perfectly happy. And these can make excellent tenants. Oh, sure. I mean, really what you're looking at is just income. And whether people earn income from their investments or whether they earn income from their pension or uh, social services or whether they earn it uh, through employment uh, in the local economy, wherever it is, you want to make sure they have income. So obviously, one of the great things about being retired is that you're not geographically linked to an income. You can go live anywhere you want to live. That's the beauty of being retired. You live off your investment income. And so there can be places in the world where there is a great lifestyle, an affordable lifestyle that is very attractive to retirees. And you can position yourself there to provide the type of housing and amenities that they're looking for and direct some of that investment income uh, into your portfolio by providing them the house. And the thing is, to your point, Robert, they, they don't have to tie up a lot of their capital. You know, if you're 70 years old and you say, okay, you know, I'm looking at a maybe a 20 year life expectancy and maybe in the next 15 years that I'm going to be able to live on my own, then uh, I'm maybe don't want to have a bunch of money tied up in a piece of property. I want to enjoy my money so I can rent and uh, put my money to work and have it producing income and then use that income to uh, support myself in my housing, but I'm going to need to rent my house from someone else. So I think the concept of ownership uh, in the sharing economy uh, is another one of those societal attitudes that's beginning to change a little bit. Used to be that, you know, owning a home was kind of a hallmark of financial achievement. But today, people are realizing, hey, I don't need to own a car, but I can still get around. And I don't need to own a car for prestige because it doesn't matter. You know, I'm just more interested in the utility. Obviously, that's more of a younger generational attitude. But certainly, uh, older folks are realizing, hey, you know, it, it could make a lot of sense for me to cash out of my home and uh, put that money to work someplace better and then just rent where I want to rent and have some flexibility in my life. You know, one of the early kind of indicators of some of those markets are, you know, the snowbird idea. And that's typically people that are retired and can spend a chunk of the year somewhere, you know, different because, hey, they live in a place that they love, but during the winter, it's freezing cold. So they go somewhere warmer. And there's many folks like that that just have a house in two cities and the other house maybe sits empty. Well, you could certainly do well by providing housing. And to your point, Russ, about the income. As real estate investors, we're concerned about the durability of the income. How likely is the next rent check to come in? If it's based on somebody's job, it's only as good as their job or their employment or their ability to stay employed. But when it is a retired person and they have that retirement income, which can come from a whole variety of sources, that's pretty stable income. And of course, one of the things we love about being landlords is that housing is one of the most important expenses people have. They'll cut out a lot of things before they'll decide not to have a roof over their heads. So those markets are, are interesting markets, perhaps, and there's unique situations in, in all of them, but the retirement markets, something to consider. 
Another type of market that we like to consider, and it's a type of market we've certainly gravitated to more as we've you know, expanded, I would say, our portfolios and our personal investment philosophy, that's what we call lifestyle markets. So this is a market where you buy a property that you actually see yourself spending some time in. Might be a couple of weeks a year, might be a couple of months a year, might be eventually you're going to retire there. But rather than buy something in a neighborhood you wouldn't be caught dead in, literally. Instead, you're buying something in a beautiful market and you're profiting from the high rents associated with such a property. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to draw a distinction between the retiree, you know, a retiree may choose some place where the weather is warm, where there's a lot of activities, where the taxes are low and there's great medical infrastructure so that they can have a healthy lifestyle. But someone else may decide, hey, in my retirement or as just part of being an active person and, and, and having a vacation property, uh, I'd like to own something or have the opportunity to spend time someplace uh, that is beautiful, that is more of a resort type of an area. And so the concept of lifestyle investing is that you own the property and when you want to enjoy it, you enjoy it. And when you're not using it, you let other people enjoy it and uh, and you collect rents. The thing is, most of those are going to operate on a monthly or a week weekly or even a nightly basis. And so when you do the math on that, assuming you have decent occupancy, the actual income uh, based on the price of the property can be very, very high. And you have much more management expense, that's for sure. Uh, but you know, if you get in with the right situation, then that can work out really well. And you end up netting what you want to net. You get a good return on your capital. Uh, you get a chance to access the property for your own personal enjoyment. You can uh, use your time allotment in the property as a barter chip and, and use it to get favors. You know, you say, tell your car mechanic, hey, fix my car. You can spend a week at my condo on the beach. And they're like, oh, okay, great. So there's a lot of ways to have it make money for you where it doesn't actually have to actually pay you a, a rent check. Uh, you know, the personal use itself is worth something. If you're not spending $1,500 a week to go on vacation somewhere because you're staying in your own property, uh, that can be a return on investment as well. Absolutely. Now, many of these markets, you also have to consider whether they're really cash flow markets, and some are because the rents can be very high, the more affluent places like maybe Hawaii or Aspen or something like that. And then there's markets that are definitely more on the cash flow side, you know, some of the lower in parts of Florida where people go to vacation on a budget or maybe the Gulf Coast in Texas, markets like Las Vegas where people, hey, want to go have a place to stay and yet when they're not using their unit. And it could be that you do that through, you know, kind of the vacation rental aspect where you just buy a unit and you put it out there uh, to the world, or it could be through a managed program where it's kind of a, what we call condo hotel where you own the unit. And when you're not staying there, then it's rented out for you. But there's some definite advantages to that. And especially as you change as a real estate investor, a lot of the real estate that we own is probably not places we want to spend a lot of time personally. But as you evolve as an investor, you may decide, hey, I do want to go have a house on a golf course and maybe I can rent it out, you know, some of the year and the rest of the year I can just golf to my heart's content. So that's part of being an investor is you get to decide what is the benefit to you. Is it pure ROI, pure tax benefit, or is there some personal enjoyment? That's what we're talking about with lifestyle markets. Lots of different real estate markets, types of markets. We're talking about how you diversify your income by picking different ones. More when we return. You're listening to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Hey everybody, it's Robert Helms inviting you to join me along with co-host Russell Gray at the Single Family Rental Home Expo. It takes place in Dallas, February 17th and 18th, and tickets are just $99. That includes general admission both days, plus a trade show pass, conference program, and free lunch and coffee. The SFR Expo features lots of experts in real estate and note investing, private lending, and much more. It all happens Saturday and Sunday, February 17th and 18th in one of the great real estate investment markets in the U.S., Dallas, Texas. Send an email to sfrexpo at realestateguysradio.com and we'll get you all the details. Or visit realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Can't wait to meet you there. Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe, CEO of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. If you're listening to this, odds are pretty good that you're already a real estate investor or at least becoming one. 
So why do you do it? Is it to hedge inflation, the tax benefits, or maybe it's to get your money away from Wall Street? It's because of these benefits and so many more that I created the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy. When you combine successful real estate investing with the Perpetual Wealth Strategy, you have the recipe for what has helped the wealthy to establish their financial well-being for decades. You can download the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy today by clicking the Resources tab on the Real Estate Guys Radio homepage. Don't wait. Go download it now. Hi, this is Chris Martinson, author of Prosper, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. Can't wait to see you at a Real Estate Guys event. It's not too late to sign up for the Summit at Sea, the biggest and grandest event we do every year. The 16th annual Summit's coming up in April 2018, and you can be there. All the details and new added faculty members on the website, realestateguysradio.com. Click on the button that says Summit at Sea. Today, we're talking about markets. And when we look at real estate markets, there's all types of markets. They have different behaviors and different characteristics. And a way to stabilize your income from real estate is to diversify across different markets. So just a couple more uh, we'll talk about. We talked about lifestyle markets. I think kind of a subset of that, and it doesn't all have to be lifestyle, is international markets. This is a market outside of the country that you live in. With listeners in more than 190 countries, you could certainly do well by investing in your own country, and you perhaps know it well, know the language, know the customs, but there may be other places in the world, and that's really a way to diversify. Well, yeah, you see it happen all the time. You know, you see wealthy people in different parts of the world. Uh, they happen to like United States real estate because the United States has a strong history of protecting private property rights and uh, having a good, solid economy, rule of law and all that. But we're not the only country. The United States isn't the only country in the world like that. We're not the only country in the world that has beaches, that has beautiful places, that have employment centers, that have working class folks. You can, you can diversify outside of a currency. Uh, there is an argument to be made for why you might want to generate income in something other than U.S. dollars. Uh, that would be a way to do it. You can park wealth in a different jurisdiction. And of course, you can marry that to lifestyle. Because now, if you have a particular part of the world that you're interested in traveling to on a regular basis and you have legitimate investments there, check with your own CPA, but probably your travel and expenses to going to that part of the world now go from being uh, after tax to being before tax because they're deductible business expenses. So you can combine a lot of these factors together to create diversification, to create income, to create cash flow, to create equity growth, uh, to uh, enhance your lifestyle, to give yourself tax breaks. There's there's a lot of different ways to play it, but international uh, certainly plays a role. Once you get your mind out of investing outside your own neighborhood or maybe even outside Outside your own state, you're just a hop, skip, and a jump away from investing outside of your own country. Uh, you know, Americans struggle with this probably more than anybody else because, for whatever reason, Americans just think that the whole world revolves around them. And a lot of other people in other parts of the world are used to crossing country borders. You know, if you look at Europe, uh, it's, you know, just like in traveling the United States, you drive a little bit, you might go through two or three states in the United States, but you still feel like, okay, but I'm in the U.S. But in Europe, you can drive the same distance and you can go to two or three different different countries. And so that's normal to them. And so the concept of investing outside their own country is less intimidating than it is, say, to an American. But still, there's a lot of reasons to do it and something that we've really enjoyed doing and learning more about and helping other people do. Uh, I think it's something that any serious investor should take a look at. Like any of these markets, there's pros and cons. The diversity is great for the things you talked about. The negative is there's a learning curve. It's not always practiced the same way it is where you're from. If you go to a new country, there's different you know ways that real estate professionals work. In some places, there aren't even real estate professionals. But if you're willing to go through the learning curve, there are some great opportunities. I tell you what, the uh, downturn was pretty rough for us. But one of the things that saved us in many ways was our diversity into foreign markets. And there's also this premise that never have we had a time in history where every single real estate market around the world has gone down. Quite the opposite. There's always a great performing market 
if you know where to look and if you're paying attention. So we like international markets. There's a few more that we could talk about, but I think in our time remaining, one of my favorite markets is what I call a sleeper market. A sleeper market is generally a market that nobody else is talking about, and there's not necessarily a lot there, usually not a top 50 MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area. This is more a boutique market, maybe a tertiary market, but it's a market where there's a play. There's some potential need that you identify as a real estate investor, and then you keep your mouth shut, right? If I'm saying, oh, I'm going to buy a single family home in Nashville. Okay, well, Nashville, near around Nashville is red hot. And maybe you want to buy a house there. It's probably going to open value because there's demand for it, but hard to make deals cash flow. But if I find a little market, then I can sometimes really make a, a return that nobody else can make. The downside of it is there's not as much ballast in a market like that, so you have to be very, very careful. Remember, we had a guy that uh, owned an apartment building in a small community like this, and he was looking for another apartment building because it had performed so well. And he was hesitant to even tell us where it was. He goes, listen, I'm not, I don't want everyone to come out and start investing in this market. But, you know, we were working with him a little bit, and he started to share with us the, the market. And I said, well, I, mean, I got some contacts around. I'll reach out. Turns out there were less than a dozen apartment buildings in the entire marketplace. There just weren't a lot. And he owned one of them. I'm like, well, the good news is you own one twelfth of the inventory in your marketplace. The bad news is you got to wait till one of the other 11 guys are selling until you can find something. Or you build something, which is a whole different discussion. Well, absolutely. And that brings up something else, which is this has really been a discussion on the types of markets. And we've used some markets as examples. Now what you overlay on that is the types of properties. Is it single family, multifamily, retail, commercial, development, holding on to land in a marketplace? Depending on the market you're looking at, there are different opportunities. So this isn't to be an exhaustive course on how to diversify completely your portfolio. We just want to get your brain thinking about, hey, where should I be looking next? There's a lot on the horizon. You know, a few weeks back, we had our two prediction shows and a ton of information there. Next week on the program, we have what we think is going to be an amazing show for you. It's going to be another one of these shows where we get a lot of folks voicing their opinion. And it's going to be a lot of fun, but we've got some, some great stuff in store as next week we talk about forecasting the future. Future. How do you get around the right people and the right information? And how do you get in a tribe and a, a social group where people are going places and doing things and you've got great input and what you hear online and all that's great. Love people listening to the podcast, but there's a bigger picture. We'll talk about that next week. We have some outstanding guests. So until next week, pick a great market or two and go out and make some equity happen. Hello, this is Robert Kiyosaki, and I'm very excited that I'll be joining the real estate guys for their Investor Real Estate Summit at Sea. Join me, join my friends, join the real estate guys, Investor Summit at Sea, and I'll see you out there. Thank you very much. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life, powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888 489 7723 extension 4. That's 888 888- 489-7723, extension 4, or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.